but now have obtained mercy. I want to speak to you about this. God is going to have a people. Praise God. He is going to have a people. Acts fifteen fourteen. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. God will have a people. Will you say that with me tonight? God will have a people. Let's praise him together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the richness of your blessing. Thank you for the mighty mercy that you've bestowed upon us. Thanking you for your goodness and your grace. Praise God. Thanking you for your love. Hallelujah, 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 praise in your form. And everybody said in Jesus' name, everybody said in Jesus' name, you may be seated, thank you. During all ages, God has had a people somewhere. In some instance, there has always been somebody to hold up his name and to glorify him. When you go back into the great record of the scriptures, there are some beautiful things that bring to us the importance of what I'm saying tonight. Many feel that the generation we're living in is perhaps the most advanced civilization of all time. And yet, there could be a question about that. Now, there have been some civilizations in times past that have accomplished some great and mighty things. I don't know of any civilization that has gone into outer space or has trodden upon the moon. But there are other generations that have secrets that this generation does not know about. And when you go back into the history of the Word of God, you will find that in the days of the beginnings, that is, the book of Genesis, in the fourth chapter, you discover that it was an age of great accomplishment. In fact, if you will note it very carefully... They had some very outstanding things take place in that time. If you will read it, you'll note that there was the first bigamist. Not only that, there was the first agriculturist. There was the first musician, Jabel, the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. There was every artificer in brass and iron. Then there were Lamech and his two wives, the first bigamist, and there was the first murder that was brought to pass in regard to the condition existing in that time. There was a murder prior to that, but it was a very serious thing. I have wounded a young man to my hurt. And then if you look at that, in the midst of that time, which downtrended until the time of Noah, in the midst of all that carnage of problems and trouble and accomplishment and despair, in the middle of all that, God had a man by the name of Enoch. And the Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God. And that man that walked with God one day was not. He was taken out of this world. The Bible uses Enoch as a very definite symbol of what will happen to the church of the living God. And you'll find that written in the pages of this book. 
He was a symbol of that which was to come. I don't know what the message of that day was. I don't believe that he had the privilege you and I have of knowing of a salvation and a Savior. I know he didn't. He had passed on to him the things that his parents had passed on to him, no doubt from Adam down. All he knew was what he knew that was passed on to him. But what he knew this man lived by. That is what's so amazing. He lived by the things that he had learned from those who had handed it to him. It was a beautiful heritage. I'm sure he knew about Adam and Eve and the beauty of the Garden of Eden that was passed on to him through those who told the story. But in all of this, in all of the accomplishments, Enoch walked with God. I'm sure he was deterred. I'm sure he was disappointed. I'm sure he was tried to be discouraged. But in spite of all that, the man walked with God, and God took him. He took him out of this world. Just a little short time later, as the dispensation comes to an end, we find Noah and his family sheltered in an ark that he made that God gave him orders to design. They've made more fun of that ark through the years, but I want you to know the last laugh is going to be the big laugh. Because Almighty God's going to show this world that the promises of His Word are true. And though they laughed at Noah as he prepared that ark and continued to work at it by faith in that which was handed to him by God, this man saved his family. And I want you to note that uh, some people think he was in that ark 40 days. My friend, he was in that ark some 13 months. If you read the scriptures, you'll notice he was in that ark 13 months. Brother Bayer made reference to a message I preached one time on the stink or the storm. Thirteen months closed in with animals, but they wouldn't have traded places for, with anybody outside because they were safe. They were safe. And all those that did not believe what Noah had to say, they tried to get in that ark, but the Bible said God closed the door. And God can close doors that no man can open. And he can open doors that no man can close. And in that hour, Noah faithful found grace in the eyes of God. And the violence of that time was so terrible until God was sorry that he ever made man. He had to be awful disappointed in man to see the wickedness of that time and be sorry that he ever made man. The scripture said he repented God that he ever made man on the face of the earth. I think he's getting another look at the same kind of a generation. I think the same conditions that existed in Noah's day, Jesus said they would exist at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. They're existing now. And we are looking at hours in which we're going to see a church raptured out of this world. Or better still, the Bible phrase is the best, caught away. There's going to be a church caught out of this life. There have been times in the history of man when there has been riding on just one person the plan of God. I don't know if you fully realize all the implications of this, but there have been times that if one person had been destroyed, the purposes of God had, would have been thwarted, destroyed. I'm reading from Second Chronicles, and I want you to notice what is said here. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah, or so she thought. She got mad because her son, the king, had been destroyed. 
so her plan was kill everything of the seed royal of Judah. If she could have accomplished her purpose, there would never have been a redeemer. The royal seed through the house of Judah projected to us a Savior, the Messiah. He came from the stock of Judah. If she had gotten her job done, it would have happened. But a 16-year-old girl by the name of Jehosheba, and I've never heard any child name that name, might be a good suggestion. Jehosheba took Joash and hid him in the house of the Lord, for he was to be the next king. She took that baby boy. Now you say, what got into Jehosheba that she had that kind of vision to understand exactly what the purposes of God were? I will always be amazed at this fact, that God has somebody somewhere that knows what his purpose is. I'm laying a foundation here tonight that I want you to understand. God always has somebody that knows what his purpose is and what his truth is. When you talk about the gift of the word of wisdom, you're not talking about learning in a secular world. You're talking about divine revelation. You're talking about what God gives to man by perception of his divine purpose and plan in the universe. And actually, he gave to Jehosheba an understanding that that boy must not be destroyed. And she took him and he hid him for six years in the house of God. During that time, Athaliah reigned. And she was wicked. She's like a lady we know in this world uh, by the name of Madeline Murray O'Hare. Same kind of spirit. Every generation has one. At the same time that every generation has some wicked woman like a Jezebel, there is always a, a counterpart. God has a Jehosheba. God has somebody that understands. God has somebody that knows. Now, I want to say this to you tonight, and I want you to fully understand what I'm saying when I make this statement to you. There's a knowledge of God that you and I must have that will carry us through the hours in which we live. And you say, what does it have to do with it has to do with everything we can understand about the purpose and the plan and the truth of God. Now, Jehosheba hid the boy. At the end of six years, they brought Joash out. The people began shouting, crying out to God. Athaliah came to see what the trumpets and the singers and the instruments of music were doing, and she saw that Joash was still alive. And the people were singing and hollering, Long live the king! They laid hands on Athaliah, and when she was come to the entering of the horse gate by the king's house, they slew her there. Let me say it to you, and say it so you understand it. There is nothing evil, wrong, vindictive, wicked that's going to stand against God's plan. No way. There is no power or force that's going to hinder the purpose of God. That's something that you and I need to understand. And there is no living Athaliah, Madeline Murray O'Hare, no present-day Jezebel that's going to staunch the flow of the purpose of God in His people. There's no hierarchy. There is no political system. There is no kingdom in this world that's going to stop the kingdom of the dear Son of God. It's going to move on. And we have to understand that it is something that cannot be destroyed. And then finally, I want you to notice the 16th verse 
of the 23rd chapter of Second Chronicles. Jehoiada, the priest, made a covenant between himself and between all the people and between the king that they should be the Lord's people. Right there on one little girl's shoulders rested the future of the seed of Judah. And God flashed it to her. Get that boy into the house of God and hide him. When you are in tune with God, you'll understand His purposes and His direction. If you're not in tune with God, you won't understand His purposes and direction. It'll be as strange as midnight to you, even in the, even at the height of the noonday sun. I want you to note, one day in Israel, they took all the young men a captive into Babylon. They took the choicest young men that were left out of Israel, and they left the others dead and dying, and raised, destroyed the walls of Jerusalem. They carried them to Babylon. And when they got them down to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar had a plan. In fact, the prophet had told the king of Judah, he said, Nebuchadnezzar is coming down. When he comes down, he's going to take your fine young men and make eunuchs out of them. What he was letting the king of Judah know that Nebuchadnezzar was going to destroy Israel forever. He had a three-pronged plan. The first thing he was going to do was going to change their names. Then he was going to change their Habits, their routines that they had learned from their godly parentage. And then he was going to make eunuchs out of them. He got a hold of four by the name of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel's name meant a judge of Jehovah. Hananiah meant Jehovah is gracious. Mishael meant who is God. Azariah meant Jehovah is thy keeper. All those Hebrews had named their children those beautiful names to remind them they belong to God. And there's something very special about heritage that's handed down to you. When it's given to you, God wants you to hold on to it and never lose it. They changed their names. They changed Daniel to Belshazzar, which means... Baal, protect my life. Hananiah to Shadrach, which means lover of Baal. Mishael to Meshach, which means bow my knee to Baal. Azariah to Abednego, which means servant of Nego, which was a heathen god. They were changing their names to brainwash them from what they were brought into this world to fulfill. But you can take a child of God, out of Jerusalem, into Babylon, or any other great heathen city. And if it's in their heart and in their life, they can't take it away from you. Oh, friend, and I want you to hear tonight that you and I have to have it so deep inside of us that nothing can wipe it out of our lives. And when you get down in old Babylon, there's a lot of temptation to do what the Babylonians are doing. Somebody could have come up to Daniel and the three Hebrew children and said, Look, you don't have to act as nice as you did in Jerusalem. But that isn't the kind of people they were. It didn't make any difference where they were. They were going to still honor their God. And Daniel made a request. He said, Look, don't give us the king's meat and the king's wine, let us have pulse and bread. Prove us for ten days. At the end of ten days, they were fatter and fairer in flesh than all the rest. But that's not all. There has to be purity before revelation. And they not only had the ability of the hand of God on them, but they had insight into divine secrets. And it was Daniel that revealed the king's dream and the interpretation thereof, because he was in tune with God. God always has a man. 
Now, I want you to know something tonight. When I say that to you tonight, I'm just jumping inside about the report we got out of Russia. You have no idea what's happening in Russia. But we wondered when we kept hearing this Polish thing, why the Polish people were taking a stand against Russian autocracy and their powerful, their powerful communistic authority in that land. I kept saying, I don't understand why they are actually inviting an invasion of the country. You know who inspired that? The Pentecostals in Russia. You say, how did that happen? Brother Sism met one of the men from Poland who had been behind the Iron Lines, the Iron Curtain, and this man said, there's a revival in Russia that you can't believe is taking place. Whole villages are being baptized with the Holy Ghost. He said, it's an outpouring. It's happening with no preacher there. The power of the Holy Ghost is falling. What happened was this. They had gotten tired of being under the hammer and sickle. They decided it's better to die free than to live a slave. And they decided to step out on street corners and testify and preach to people what they felt in their hearts. And when they did, there were numbers of them arrested. But the others took courage, and they decided to go out the same way. Well, when it happened, the Holy Ghost began to fall. And when the Holy Ghost began to fall, they couldn't arrest them at all. And the power of the Holy Ghost has swept over the land of Russia in this hour. Oh, you have to, you have to go back a little bit. And I'm saying this to you because I want to show you how God preserves the people. When my dad left the land of Persia as a missionary, he lost his passport. Persia put him out of the land. Russia was the only place that would receive him. In Russia, while he was there for four months, waiting for his passport to come, he went to preaching. And when he went to preach in the 200, 300 people that were buried in the name of the Lord and filled with the Holy Ghost were called Urshanites. You know why they were called Urshanites? Because they believed the doctrine of Acts 2.38. The doctrine Urshan was preaching. That people actually weathered the storm of the communistic takeover where many of them were placed in Siberia, many imprisoned, but they never gave up their testimony. There was nothing they could do to drive it out of them. And they held it on, held on to it until today there's a sweeping avalanche of the Spirit, Spirit of God across Russia. Before my dad died, I want you to know, he got us together. He said, I want you to sign a paper. And I said, sign a paper for what? He said, I want $3,000 I have saved to go to Russia as soon as it's opened. And I looked at him and I said, you don't need for us to sign a paper. We'll take care of that money and see that it happens to sign. We signed. He said, someday Russia's going to come open. He said, and I want to tell you something, son, about the Russians. Once they get the truth in their heart, they'll never go back on it. He said, those people will die for it. And they have decided that they will never, never, ever give up this truth. And they're going to swamp the common turn. Russia's not only going to have battle from without, but she's going to have spiritual insurrection from within. Because the people are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. God's going to have a people right in the midst of the trouble. Here sits Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Daniel and the three Hebrew children then take their stand. There comes a time an idol is set up. 
When you hear the sound of the music, you've got to bow down to this idol. You say, what kind of music was it? Rock music? You say, what kind of music was it? Some of that heathenistic Babylonian music? Hey, there's nothing new in the earth today. Don't, don't you ever forget it. There's nothing new in this earth today. I can take you to some of those recordings and play them for you. I have some of them that were brought from that part of the world. It's the same junk they're putting on the air today. And I don't understand them. Do you understand them? I bet they have somebody interpret them to me. And when they interpreted some of those words, I got red in the face. And it takes a lot to make me red. Some of that stuff is dirty, low-down suggestion. It's filled with immorality. And if you've got a boy in your house and you're a man of your house, make him throw him out the window and keep the house clean. You're going to bow down before that idol when you hear the sound of the dulcimer and the flute and the sackbut. No, no, no. I like what they said. I like what they said. This is the kind of a feeling the people of God have. I want you to know what they said. They said, we know that our God can deliver us. But if He don't deliver us, we will not bow down. It doesn't make any difference. Life or death, we're going to serve God. That's the spirit of the people of God. Life or death, we're going to serve God. And those people took their stand. And of course, you, heard, you know the story of the fiery furnace and all the things that happened in that respect. And then he tried to make eunuchs out of those boys. The idea was to leave them without having any children. By destroying the seed of those men, he could destroy the future of Israel. He had planned to destroy Israel. But Israel is still existing. The chosen of the Old Testament are still existing. There never will be anybody that can destroy the people of God, no matter what kind of plans they set up. I want you to know something tonight. I want you to hear it tonight. I want to, uh, to refer to something Brother Bayer said today because we need to get really on the ball about this in our whole movement. We're letting too many exist amongst us that are getting too easy and too compromising about matters that pertain to God. In Deuteronomy 22 and 5, I want you to hear it again because it's a very, very important thing. It's just as important to us as it was to the children of Israel in the day when they were in the land of Babylon. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. How would you like me preaching an address up here tonight? Someone said, my Lord. I mean it would be my Lord. If you saw me in a dress, I want you to know this suit covers a multitude of shin. If you saw me in a dress, you would say, horrible. But the Bible says the same thing about the man as it does the woman. That he should not dress like the woman. And then also it says that the woman shall not dress like that that pertaineth to a man. And I want you, wanting you to know tonight that the spirit of unisex is in our world. And it's a powerful spirit. And it's gripping a lot of people. And it's infringing into the church life. And a lot of our preachers are too weak need to stand up against it. Now, I'm not talking about Georgia. I want you to know there are some who are afraid of members in the congregation when it comes to matters like this. 
And then a, a lady, a lady came even one day. She said, "Well, if you're going to insist on preaching that to this congregation, then you will have to go down where it says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of divers sorts as of woolen and linen together. I said, No, man. They are as different as night and day. I said, One is the moral law and the other is the ceremonial law. And what you said about abomination, I want you to note in the 21st chapter of Revelation, 27th verse, Anything that works as abomination shall not enter there. And I want, to, want you to hear something. You will have to go to the Old Testament to find out what an abomination is. There is only a few verses in the New Testament that has to do with abomination. It has to do with the harlot in the 17th, 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. It has to do with the verse in the 21st chapter and the 27th verse and another one about a proud and arrogant look. But I want you to know, friend, the spirit of homosexualism, lesbianism, has gripped our world and is sweeping over our times. And they're trying to challenge the pulpit with it. But there we have to go to the Old Testament to find where an abomination is. And you and I need to understand what thus saith the Word of God. Hear what I'm saying to you tonight. In Philadelphia, before we had our convention, I didn't announce this to the general board, Brother Wheatley, but they told me you're going to get challenged from the floor by the homosexual community. And I said, for what? They said, they are going to insist that you ordain homosexuals. And I said, who is going to do it? They said, there are people coming in that have been hired to step out on the floor and challenge you as you stand in that pulpit as general superintendent. I didn't say anything to anybody, but I was ready. Oh, friend, I was waiting for them to come. They never did come. They never did come. And I asked somebody, I said, they didn't come. The man that told me they were coming, I said, how come they didn't come? He said, they got cold feet. They backed away. He said, they were here one night. I said, what happened? He said, when they were going to challenge on the floor, a whole bunch of folks right close to them went to praising God and speaking in tongues, and they got out of there. Oh, friend. They took off. They don't understand that sound. They don't understand the sound of praise. They don't understand the sound of glorifying God in other languages. They don't understand it. Oh, I didn't know. This happened in Washington, D.C. In that Washington for Jesus rally. We didn't know it happened. A man got up on the platform one day. They had been speaking through times uh, throughout the day. And uh, finally this one man said, There's a lot of Pentecostals out there. I haven't heard a Pentecostal praise yet. When he said that, my goodness, it rose like a tumult. It came from everywhere. And when it happened, we didn't know this. But the gay group, what do they call them gay for? Good Lord, have mercy. That is nothing. That doesn't even give them the right kind of sound. They're not gay, they're nay. That gay group had their signs up, and they were going to march through that Washington for Jesus group. And they had it already. Brother McFarland told me about it. He said, I was standing there watching them. And they started to come at the crowd when this man said, Come on, let's hear some praise. And they went to praising God and talking in tongues. And when they did that, they threw their signs down and went running off. They can't handle that, friend. They can't handle that. The presence of God is too real for them. Oh, they can't handle what's here tonight. There's too much going on here tonight for them to handle anything like this. But I got some news for you. I want you to start. Give that man the microphone. I want you to start quoting from that portion of Scripture you were reading today. 
Start from the 12th verse, if you will. I want you to hear this, if you will, please. Read. But oh. these. Yes, sir. All right, stand up. But these as natural brute beasts. Natural brute beasts. Made to be taken. Made to be taken. Speak evil. Speak evil. Of the things that they understand. I want you to understand. If you find a gay homo, you'll find they despise authority. Every time. So, friend, don't go showing how big you are. We might get a wrong interpretation of what you are. Anybody that despises government or authority in their spiritual life has a wrong spirit, has a wrong attitude. And that attitude will destroy your soul. I want you to know something tonight. You live in a democracy. And you walk into a theocracy. You sit out there in a democracy. And you walk in here and think the theocracy is like your democracy. It's not. When you walk into the house of God, you come in subject to the man of God. And when you walk in subject to the man of God, you have to listen to what he says and obey his voice. And that spirit of anarchy is a spirit that comes from the pit of hell. Read on, or quote, and shall utterly perish, utterly perish, in their own corruption, in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward, shall receive the reward, of unrighteousness, of unrighteousness, spots they are, spots they are, blemishes, blemishes, sporting themselves, sporting themselves, yes, while they feast with you, yes, having eyes full of adultery, full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, cannot cease from sinning. Listen to what I'm saying. There are people that sit in our churches. Oh, I want you to hear it. They sit in our churches, and there's no use hiding our heads like an ostrich. They're in our churches, and they're coming amongst us, and I want you to hear it, brethren. They're in the ministry. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I have in my pocket ten names. We're just waiting till we can find it out that they are what they are. And we're going to put them out. I want you to know that. We are not going to let them sit amongst us with eyes of adultery, with a spirit of fornication, with a spirit of homosexualism, and rob us of the glory of God. They're going to perish in their own corruption. God's going to have a people that are clean and holy and pure and undefiled and unadulterated. Clean by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hold on. Beguiling unstable souls. Beguiling unstable souls. They have a way. Oh, friend, I wish I could call some names tonight. And the reason why I can't is because we must absolutely know so that we can take from them that privilege amongst us. But there's evidence enough. And every once in a while, when we run into something like this, there's always somebody saying, I'm going to champion their cause. One little boy said, what's wrong with him? I said, I cannot say it this time, but let him alone. I'll champion him, I said, and you'll go down with him. You see, what I'm saying to you tonight, they are infiltrating the church of the living God. You say, Brother Urshan, in the United Pentecostal Church, where we, he's quoting from the New Testament. Simon Peter was telling them that they were in that apostolic church. 
if they were in that apostolic church, they'll infiltrate anything. They like to hang themselves in an area where they can discreetly ply their wares. And they can use uh, the objects of people for their ungodliness, beguiling unstable souls. Read on. Hold on. Cursed children. Cursed children. Which have forsaken the right way. Forsaken the right way. And are gone astray. Gone astray. Following the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam. Preaching for money. Hey, friend, let me tell you something. If you come in the ministry for money, you have come into the wrong area. And please understand what I'm saying to you. That doesn't mean that God won't honor you and give you finance. But what you do with that finance, man, you better be careful. You better not use it for your great personal advantages. You better use it to spread this message all over the world. I'm going to say it to you tonight, whether you're a lay member or a prelate or a man of God or whatever you claim to be, I want you to know nobody that handles and abuses the money of God wrongly should be allowed to exist within the church of God. Now, uh, that's strong. Amen. And I want you to know we need to take another look at ourselves. We need to take a personal assessment. You, you know, here we are tonight. Uh, many of us have reaped where we have not sown anything. God Almighty gave us something that we never got for ourselves. God gave it to us through the labor of others, and we're sitting here enjoying what God has passed down to us, acting like we did it all, and we didn't do it all. We never did it all. God Almighty sent some forerunners amongst us that loved His name, and they handed us a truth that we should hold on to. And if we fail God, we're going to fail that responsibility. That's why when I hear some of these people say it's not wrong to have a pants suit, I want to I want to bomb it because it's the spirit of unisex and it's going to get a hold of the church and they don't understand that. You and I need to understand the spirit of unisex must go. God made a difference between the man and the woman. Hallelujah! One old boy was talking to me about the, about this thing, and he said, "There's not a Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's not a male nor female in Christ Jesus." I said, "You believe that?" He said, "Yes." I said that's why it doesn't make any difference what they wear. I said, "You're a little silly." I asked him the question, do you have men and women toilets in your church? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, you've got to distinguish. I asked him another question. I said, would you marry a man to a man? He said, you know I wouldn't. Well, I said, you said there's not a male nor female in Christ. I said, would you marry a woman to a woman? He said, no, sir. I said, then you can't use the Scripture the way you're using it. God sees the soul of man. And he said, there's neither male nor female in Christ. Meaning that as far as God, as the soul was concerned, God was concerned about man's soul. But he gave the rules for marriage. He told what a man should be, and he told what a woman should be. And he put it all in that book. And he's going to have a people. He's going to have a people. Oh, friend, he's going to have a people. He's going to have a people that love this message. 
he was sitting one day at our table. He said, Brother Ocean, Brother Ocean, he said, is there anything you see in me that could improve? And I looked over at Sister Ursh and she got white as a sheet. And I said, uh, you really want me to tell you where you can improve? He said, oh yes, bear your soul. I said, you want me to tell you what I think you can improve with? He said, yes. I said, get ready. I saw Sister Urshan turn her back, bend over the sink, and get busy with the dishes. I said, walk like a man! Talk like a man! Think like a man! I heard Sister saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, praise God. You know, it's about time we call some of these things out. They're getting so bold that they want to walk in the church and challenge the pulpit. Then we're going to let you know where we stand. We're going to let you know how we feel about it. God bless your heart. God wants a distinction between people. I'm going to say some more. He's got, he's going to have a people. And I have nobody in mind when I say this. Here, a few years ago in Indianapolis, there was a detective in our city. Long hair down to his shoulders. Whiskers down to his chest. And uh, he worked with the narcotics squad. He's a big, burly, bruising man. I walked up, pulled one of his curls and said, You're cute. When I said that, he turned around to me. He said, Urshan. If you weren't a preacher, I'd bust every tooth out of your mouth. And brother, he could have done it with one blow. He was huge. And he turned to me, he said, you know how I hate this hair. You know how I hate this beard. You know how I hate the way I have to dress. He said, it's the only way I can get into drug culture. They won't take me clean shaven. They won't take me the way you look. I can't get amongst them and find out what they are, but the day they pull me out of this drug culture, I'm going to look just like you. That's what the detective said. And so I told the church, I said, if a detective has to look like that to get in the drug culture, what in God's name are we looking like that for if that's the way that still exists? Someone said that's all passe enough. I'm not saying that everybody that has a beard and has a mustache is in the drug culture, but who wants to look like them? That's what I'm asking you. Who wants to look like them? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. God's going to have a people. It's not necessary for you to drink that uh, uh, water, that pulse, and that, and eat those, uh, and drink that water, eat those vegetables, but we're, we are Hebrews. We wouldn't violate our position for anything. I was teaching that to children in a class one day, and I was, I was using the scripture, one shall put a thousand to flight. Two shall put 10,000 to flight. And I thought I'd test the children's thinking. I said, if one puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight, how many will three put to flight? One little boy said, 100,000. I said, right. That's God's arithmetic table. I said, I thought I'd test them a little further. I said, if one puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight, three puts 100,000 to flight, how many would four put the flight? One little boy said, One million! And I thought, Man, man, I'm getting way out. And all of a sudden, the Lord brought to my memory the history of Babylon. They said it was a place of one million people and four men. 
took their stand. And when they took their stand, the king was saying, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Four men took their stand. Oh, I want to shout. I want to shout tonight. There's something beautiful about this, friend. There's something marvelous about it. Our God said, I want you to notice, He said, in regard to the prophecy of the days of of His coming, He said, that they shall eat and drink and marry and be giving in marriage. That's divorce and remarriage. But I want you to notice about Sodom and Gomorrah said, they built it, they planted, they bought, they sold. Then same thing about marriage, those dirty rascals. Said nothing about marriage about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know why it didn't say anything about marriage? They had gotten into that situation where they did not have any rules of marriage. That's why God took it away. But I want you to hear Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 16, 49, and 50. This was the sin of thy sister Sodom. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness. She failed to strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. Pride. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness. She failed to strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. Therefore, God took her away because of her abomination. The sin of, of, of sodomy was not even mentioned. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. She failed to strengthen the hands of the poor and needy long before it breaks out in the incestuous aspects of lasciviousness and perversion. It has set itself in the heart of man. Long before. And there's a pride and an arrogance that goes before it. And we're looking at it. Quote on, sir. There's some more to that, if you will. Listen. Who love the wages of unrighteousness. Yes, sir. They preached for money. And Balaam hired himself out to curse the children of God. When he got out there to curse the children of God, he'd get out there and say, The Lord bless thee. He did that three times. He couldn't curse. He finally said to old Balak, he said, how can I curse what God hasn't cursed? And friend, you better get with it. You can't curse the church. Amen. You can't stop the church. Amen. You, you, you know what the Lord God said to Saul of Tigers? He said, why persecutest thou me? But someone said, he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church. When you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting the Lord. It's, you, it's all together directed at God. And you think that when you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting a man or a people. No, sir. You're persecuting the Almighty God. The church is His only instrument in this world Amen. that He has to channel the fullness of His glory through it. And we're looking at it today. Oh, hear, hear it. Hear it. Read on, sir. Listen. Hold on. But was rebuked for his iniquity. Rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice. All right. Read on. Forbade the madness of the prophet. Yes. These are wells without water. Wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Clouds carried without a tempest. With a tempest. With a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness. The mist of darkness. Is reserved Dirt. forever. Forever. But when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they have what? They allure through the lust of the flesh, through and much wantonness. Yes. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Yes. While they promised them liberty. Yes. They themselves were are the servants of corruption. Yes. They themselves are the servants of corruption. Yes. For of whom a man is overcome. Yes. Are the same. Is he brought into bondage? All right. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, 
to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes. They are again entangled therein. What happened? And overcome. What happened? The latter end, the latter end is worse, worse with them, with them than the beginning. Than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known, known the way of righteousness, of righteousness than after they had known it, known it, to turn, to turn from the holy command, holy command, delivered unto them, delivered unto them. But it happened, happened unto them, yes. according to the true proverb, yes, the dog, dog is turned to his own vomit, vomit. and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mud. Thank you. My Lord have mercy. Hey, you say that doesn't happen in the church. It happened in the apostolic church. And you and I are looking at that same thing. And folks, let me say to you, you're sitting here tonight in the midst of a beautiful spiritual visitation on this campgrounds. God's been in this camp meeting, Brother Weeby. He's been in this camp meeting. And you sit here and you don't get warmed and moved by the presence of the Holy Ghost, there's something in you. And I'm going to say something more than that. If you get resentful for what you heard tonight, your spirit's wrong. Yes, sir. That spirit will destroy you and you'll perish in your own corruption. Oh, friend, we're looking at a people who need to realize that this great God of ours is on the throne and that He still has a people in this day. I sat one day in Congress and three congressmen sat right next to me. And when they got through talking, they said this to me. They said, Brother Urshan, we want you to know something about what we know about your movement. And I said, tell it to me. They said, you're the last movement left that doesn't drink strong drink and does not violate the code of dress. said, you're the last movement left that's holding on to strong tenets of holiness. If you fail God, kiss the church goodbye. Congressmen said that to me. They sat at the table, told that to me, to Brother Rose, to Brother Oggs. They sat there and recognized it. You think we don't have something to live for? You think we don't have something to stand up for? You think the world is not looking this way? I want you to know they're looking to see if there's a people that will take their stand. God's going to have a people. He's going to have a people in this hour. Not only that, but I want you to notice this. One day Jeremiah was so broken up, so broken up, so torn by the apostasy of Israel, that when he looked at them, he decided he wouldn't preach again. But the fire burned in his bones. While he mused, the fire burned in his bones. He even said, Brother Patterson, he said, My very closest friends, are looking for something in me so they can accuse me. He took such a strong stand in his day till his friends wanted him to fail so they could accuse him. He said, my closest bosom friends want me to fail. There are people that don't want to see anyone live right because they're grubbing in the dirt themselves. And they don't like to see anybody take stands and try to lift the level of living to a high plane of righteousness and holiness. And in this respect, I want you to know, Jeremiah got so discouraged. The Lord God said, I want you to go down and visit the wreck of bites. Oh, brother, that 35th chapter of Jeremiah is something. I want you, if you will, brother... Uh, there to get the last verse of the 35th chapter handy for me. They went, this man Jeremiah went down to the Rechabites and the Lord God said, tell them to drink wine. He got down there and he said, drink wine. 
And you know what they said to him? Now, this is a delicate thing. Here's the man of God coming, saying God told him to tell them to drink wine. That's the amazing thing about it. It's a delicate thing when a man comes along who's a minister and tells you to do something. But God did tell him. But you know what God knew about those Rechabites? He knew he had a people that would never go back on their vow. God knows who his people are. And he knew that he needed to encourage Jeremiah. Jeremiah went down there and he said, drink wine. They said, as long as life shall last. Our father Jonadab taught us that we should not put a razor to our head. We should not live in homes. We should dwell in tents. And we should not drink strong drink. Jeremiah, there's no way that we will drink the wine that you have offered us because we're going to be faithful to our vow. The Lord turned to Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, go tell the house of Israel. I've got a people that will not go back on their vow. Let them know that I've got somebody that will stand. And then he gave them a promise. I want you to read that promise. The last verse of the last chapter of Jeremiah 35. Listen to this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. The God of Israel. The God of Israel. Jonadab. Jonadab. The son of Rechab. Son of Rechab. Shall not want a man. Shall not want a man. Now stand before me. Stand before me. Forever. Forever. Because they would not bow down. He said they'll have somebody standing before my presence forever. Oh, God's going to have a people. I want you to know something before I close tonight. How much did it cost to, to bring us our redemption? It cost the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That beautiful body was mutilated on the cross. That beautiful life was scorned by man. He hung suspended between heaven and earth and became the object of the hate of the whole world. He died in ignominy because he was the one that was the, the, the one that was to be our champion. And our world has their champion. Muhammad Ali says he's the greatest. He is not. He's the, one of the biggest farces in the world. Anybody that claims to be the greatest is always a big farce. Maybe he can box well. He can talk, he can talk too. But I want you to know something else. I know who the greatest is. I know who the greatest is. Muhammad Ali never threw a punch like my Lord did. I want you to know he went down in the bottom of hell. He took the keys of hell and death out of the hand of Satan. And he came back to say, Behold, I am he which was and which is and which is to come, the Almighty. And behold, I have the keys of hell and of death. He gave Satan a knockout blow to give us a name that's above every name. Cleanse us by His blood. We need a people that's not afraid of anything. I was sitting at the telephone desk one day when I got a call said, Get down to Washington and Virginia Avenue just as quick as you can. And I said, What's going? They said, Don't ask questions. Get here. I got down to find a big city bus had made a halfway a turn around the corner. It was stopped. There were police cars. There were two ambulances. And the man grabbed me and said, get in the bus as quick as you can. I got in the bus and saw the strangest sight I've ever seen in my life. I saw a man, hands raised toward heaven, talking with tongues, and a doctor with a stethoscope on his heart. And when I got in there, I looked, it was so cute. Honest, it was the cutest thing. That old boy didn't even know who was around. He was talking in tongues. He had been seeking the Holy Ghost. 
I told him on the Sunday night before, I said, you get to praising God all night and all day. And he said, I'm going to do it. And I guess he had done it. But he had gone to work that day. He said he had actually closed his mouth so he wouldn't praise God. He said he actually closed his mouth so he wouldn't praise God. Because he's afraid he'd lose his job. He said he got on that bus. Now this, he, he, he was there. The old doctor was examining his heart. I looked at the doctor. I said, what do you think, doctor? He says, strange case. Strange case. Never seen anything quite like it. So I said to him, I said, I'll take care of him. He handed me the stethoscope. He said, all right, doctor, you take care of him. He thought I was another doctor. I said, no, 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 no. No, I'm the preacher. I said, he got the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. He folded up his little stethoscope, put it in his little case, and walked out. I turned to the boy. He said, it came to He said, have I embarrassed you? I said, no, but you sure stopped traffic. The man, you got traffic stopped all over this corner. Oh, when this was noise abroad. And I said, you got traffic stopped at the busiest intersection in Indianapolis. It's 515 when the biggest and most traffic is going. And he said, what do we do? I said, let's, let's get up and walk out, see what happens. Man, I felt like the Apostle Paul. I, I got out there. Brother Bill, I want you to know I got out uh, on that steps of that bus, and I said, do thyself no harm. Man. I said, this man's been filled with the Holy Ghost. A big old lieutenant that I know by the name of Thompson. He said, all right, our son. Get him out of here. You've got traffic stuff. Take him down to the church. Talking tongues all night long. Get him out of here. Praise God. Oh, praise. You can't believe the crowd that was in church the next night. You can't believe the crowd that was in church. They were all out there to see somebody speak with other tongues again. I want you to know he's going to have a people. And I'm almost afraid to tell you what I'm going to suggest now. I'm afraid maybe there's some of you here that might go way beyond it. Some of us ought to do a little talking in tongues in public. Old Brother Dudley used to talk in tongues when he came to our home. Brother Ed Wheatley, he'd talk in tongues when he prayed for the food. Man, he'd get with it, you know. Oh! He was just a praying, talking tongues, you know. And one day, my boy Andy was just about eight. One day, Brother Dudley just prayed a short prayer. And he whispered to me, has he backslid? Because every time he prayed, he would talk in tongues. And he thought maybe he'd lost his glory. Oh, friend, I think we need to have the glory of God upon us. Ah, it's about time this apostolic church let the whole world know what we are. Oh, I feel good in my soul. He's going to have a people. Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, holy nation. Holiness is your nationality. You're not white America. You're not black America. You're holiness. You're not Irish. You're not Iranian. You're not Syrian. You're not Assyrian. You are holiness. That's your nationality. You think I'm talking silly? Holiness is your nationality. Does it have a language? And we're the only ones that can interpret it. It's got a language. It's not only got a language, it's got a flag. It's not only got a flag, it's got a king. It's not only got a king, it's got a government. It's not only got a government, it's got an attorney. 
got a judge. It's got an interceptor. It's got everything. A people for his name. Oh, let's stand and worship him. For his name's sake. A peculiar people called out of darkness into this marvelous light. Think about it. Who were once not a people, but now you're the people of the Lord. You look across this audience. No way you could bring a bunch like this together and make them live at peace if it wasn't for the mercies of God. No way. Thank God for the rain. Lord God, send some spiritual rain. <coughs> no way that any people could be brought together like this under one name and still retain an individuality and yet a collective spirit of understanding. No way that we could be brought together and still have a unity of purpose. Oh, man. I, I, I don't say this caustically. There's too many hard heads here. It takes the Lord to put His Spirit there. We understand each other because of His Spirit. Stubbornness, rebellion, goes out and God comes in and He has a people for His name's sake. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want you to sing with me till you lift the rafters on this place. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things He has done. Oh, with His blood He has saved. With His power He has raised me. To God be the glory for the things He hath seen again. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Oh yes, to God. Be the glory for the thing He has done. Oh, with His blood, He has saved me. With His power, He has raised me. To God be the glory for the thing He has done. All right, I want you to hear. Last night, we laid hands on people here. Five received the Holy Ghost at least. Not only that, a girl came to say that she had impaired eyesight. God opened her eyes wonderfully, said she sees perfectly. God was in it last night. He's here tonight. If you need anything from God, you need to make your way to this place of prayer right now. You need the Holy Ghost. Come on, friend. Whatever you need from the presence of our God, 
wherever you are in this audience, make your way to this place of prayer. Kneel before God. Let His holy hand touch your life. And get with the people who love His name and love His cause. Where are you tonight? While we're singing, we invite you to come. Oh, yes, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the thing He has done. Oh, fill it with the Holy Ghost, with His blood. With His blood He has saved me. With His power He has raised me. To God be the glory for the thing He has done. Oh, yes, with His blood He has saved me. With His power He has raised me. To God be the glory for the thing He has done. Sing it! Father, He has saved me with His power. He hath raised me to God. Be the glory for the thing He hath done to God. Sing now. Be the glory to God. Be the glory for your soul. To God be the glory for the things He has done. Come on, saints of God, let's pray for some of these men. He has saved me. With His power, He has raised me. To God be the glory for the things He has done. Oh yes, with His blood, with His blood He has saved me. With His power, he hath raised me to God be the glory. We need some prayer warriors up here. We need some praying people up here. To God be the glory. To God be the glory.